have this precious passage of scripture. And I want to give it to you because it's the last time I read it to you for this particular series this month. It reads this way. I read out of the Amplified, so if you don't have it, don't let that bother you. It should be on the monitor behind me. I give you what kind of commandment, everyone? A new commandment that you should do what? Just as I have loved you, so you too should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. Everybody shout, all right. Say it again. I want to read our theme verses for this month, uh, for the year, uh, to you in your hearing also out of the Amplified, and then I'll share with you our thought for the day. But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into uh, favor, brought us into harmony uh, with himself, and gave to us the ministry of, y'all tell me what, Reconciliation, that by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, a restoration to favor. Somebody shout, thank you, God. So then, in, in, in conclusion to what I just told you, we are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We, as Christ's personal representatives, beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to God. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. Everybody shout, the ministry of reconciliation. Today, we will speak specifically to this thought, substitutionary love. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. So look over at your neighbor and tell him, before I take my seat, I want to tell you that I'm committed to listening about how I can walk in substitutionary love this week. Thank you. Let me take my seat. We define this idea of substitutionary love this way, putting yourself in someone else's place and feeling what they feel. Everybody shout, all right, then. Substitutionary love, we define Sister, Sister Butler as putting yourself in another's place and then aiming to feel what they feel. Everybody shout, all right. Say it again. As we read to you in John chapter 13, what God said to us through his son Jesus, he said to us that, hey guys, all of you who are following me as my disciples, that's where we left last week. We left off last week by saying that ultimately, if we're going to walk in sacrificial love, that we must understand and recognize first and foremost that to live this life for Christ, to live it and, and, and operate in this new commandment that he has given us, we must begin to to live a life of delivered people. We must make up our mind that the grace of God is sufficient enough to cause us to live better. The world needs to see us live better. We must be committed to living better. I think it is a sad testament to the power of God that the people of God show up in his sanctuary every single week and go out just like they came in. It is difficult for me to comprehend how you and I can come in and out of the presence of God and leave the same way and expect for others to follow us in and out. They can go in and out of clubs and leave the same way. The reason that we are here, the reason we invite you to join us here is because we are convinced that the love of God is so great that he will never leave you like he found you. That he, he will bring you to a new place of expecting more out of yourself, are you listening to me, than you expected when you were living without him. So that's the first thing, that when we talk about walking in love, we have to figure out, okay God, now how can the grace that has redeemed me help me to live my life as a better person, live my life by, by, by 
by a greater command than I was living by before. Secondly, if I'm going to live delivered, people are going to watch me. They're going to be attracted to me. And then guess what? It is up to me, Minister Rike, to say, God, help me to reach somebody. Help me to live in this life as a deliverer. I am here today because I expect someone to get set free and to get delivered because we gathered. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah, that, that's what it means to live a life that is bigger than yourself. Our singing, our praying, our preaching should lead somebody out of bondage. Somebody shout, yes, Lord. It should say to some wayward soul that, no, turn back to God because he is truly turning to you. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. Say it again. I don't know about you, but as we do that, then ultimately we have this amazing command from God we said to you last week when we left you, and that is to make disciples. That there is no greater command. As a matter of fact, um, Elder Carlo was at a, a, a missions conference this week, and he sent me a quote on last evening that was stated at the conference, and it went something like this. Uh, Dr. Haggai said, he says, people ask me why at 99, he's 99 years old, why I am still so passionate about missions, about reaching people. And he said, it is because God's last command has become my first passion and priority. God's last command, Matthew 28, go into all the world, baptizing men, teaching them all things I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of them. That's his last command to us. He said it has become my first priority and my passion. Wouldn't it be amazing if we all lived that way? If we all lived a life where the last command of Christ became our first priority and passion. That we lived our lives every day to say, hi, I want to live in such a way that I reach somebody with the life I'm living. Ultimately, it won't be me reaching them. It'll be God reaching through me, but I must be available for him to reach someone through me. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. That brings us to this idea of substitutionary love. In the idea of substitutionary love, we have to be willing to step into that person's place so that we can better understand that person. We have to be willing to say, it's not enough for us to go to church together. How can I put myself where you are to better understand what it is you're going through? Before I trip out on you, before I flip out on you because you're not holding up to the standard I placed on you when you joined, how about we take the time to, to identify a little deeper with where people are? Are y'all listening to me? One of the problems I have with church folks some places, not all places, but some places, is how easy it is is to say that we're with you and then how easy it is to bail on people once you find out they not everything you thought they were. Y'all listening to me? It is amazing what revelation will bring and how it will impact relationships. So y'all listening to me? I can tell y'all this, that my wife right there who, she just reminded me, baby, we will be married, have been married 22 years Friday. I said, that is right, 22 years on Friday. I know stuff about her I did not know 28 years ago. 29 years ago, 27 years ago, however many years ago, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, when I saw her in a high school gymnasium. I know stuff about her I did not know. I did not know when I saw her, when I saw her and saw the curls in her head, I did not know that that was an S curl. I didn't. I said, this girl is so beautiful, and look at her hair, her hair, her hair. I didn't know it, but I know it now. I know it now. It is amazing what intimacy will unveil about people, um, Dick and Lee. I did not know. I, and, and, and this is going to be a newsflash to everybody, so do not hold this against her. I did not know that when she wakes up, she, like every other person on the planet, has morning breath. I did not know that when I saw her. I was so mesmerized by the way she looked and everything that it wasn't until we got more intimate and we said good morning that I realized <laughs> it's going to be good later. <laughs> I did not know that when she wakes up, she doesn't look like she looks. <laughs> I didn't know it takes a little bit of effort. I did not know that, but I know it now. And even after knowing what I know now, I, <laughs> listen, listen, 
If I get in trouble for telling y'all what y'all already know, and that is after we sleep for a, mi- a while with our mouth shut, we all need some toothpaste and some mouthwash. That ain't, that ain't no news flash. But I didn't know that. So I, I thought that this girl is different. God sent her die here. She don't need Listerine or nothing. <laughs> and then I walked with her for a while and realized, hmm, that relationships take a little work. We find out stuff about people after we grow closer to them that we did not know when we were dealing with them from a distance. And our challenge becomes, can we still love them even through the flaws that we're exposed to as we become more intimate? Y'all listening to me? I said, y'all listening to me? We've been talking on Wednesday nights over and over. Who is it more difficult to communicate with? People who are at a distance or people who are up close? And to a person, more times than not, people said it's more difficult to communicate with those who are up close because we have seen each other in ways that make us vulnerable and, and a little defensive at what's coming from the person that we love. So God has to give us grace to deal with one another so that we can operate in in the love that he has commanded us to love, a walk in. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. So I put this quote in your notes from Tim Kelly. It says, God created the world in an instant, instant, and it was a beautiful process. He recreated the world on the cross, and it was a horrible process. That's how it works. Love that really changes things and redeems things is always a substitutionary love. It's always a love that is willing to hurt on behalf of another. It's always a love that is willing to be challenged on behalf of another. Are y'all listening to me? Would you do me a favor and look over at the person on your left and right and ask them, how much do you love me? Yes. That's right. Get it from uh, uh, Dr. White. How much do you love her? Do you love her enough to be troubled for her? Do you love her enough? Uh, do you love her enough, Brother Smith, to be troubled for her? Not, not, not just be troubled by her, but to be troubled for her. And substitutionary love puts us in a place where we go through trouble for or on behalf of another. It is not our trouble. It is not our burden to bear. But because we love you, we would step in and bear some of the load with you. That is a different kind of love than we are accustomed to. But it is the kind of love that God commands us when he says a new command I want to give you. Amen. Everybody shout amen. Say it again. Say it again. Say it one more time. So let me give you the four musts of substitutionary love as I make my way to my seat. Y'all all right? I have 22 minutes. I will tell you these in about 15. Y'all ready? You must be willing, first and foremost, the first must is that you must be willing to forgive your loved one. If you're going to walk in substitutionary love, you must understand and recognize that people that you love will disappoint you. They will hurt you. They will let you down from time to time. And the enemy is counting on you getting so disappointed, so hurt, so let down by people you love that you, that you walk in unforgiveness. That you say, the nerve of you to hurt me like that, the nerve of you to make me feel like that, and I'm just going to stop loving. I'm telling you that that's not an option in God's kingdom. God says, I want you to love, and I want you to love, I want you to love substitutionary, which means you will have to forgive people who have not asked for it sometimes. Now, our greatest example of substitutionary love and forgiving being a must of substitutionary love is, of course, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to the earth. He came to the earth, and he suffered not because of wrong he did. He suffered but because of wrong you and I did. He suffered because of you and I and the stuff that we do. And yet, he said, I'm willing to suffer on their behalf so that they can understand what I'll ask for them once they leave my cross. 
He, I am willing to go through this whipping, this beating, this rejection so that they can understand first and foremost that before they went through it, I know what it feels like and now they can go through it also. Are y'all listening to me? But he did not. What I love about Jesus is that when his daddy was turning his back against him, turning his back on his son so that he could turn his face to us, Jesus didn't turn his back on us. He kept, he kept forgiving. He kept saying to them before he, on the cross he said father forgive them for they know not what they do and one of the things that is difficult one of the things that is difficult is to see good folk i'm talking about good folk in families in church i'm talking about in communities just go through get turned off by something another did and then never talk anymore never speak anymore as if they have a license to walk around in unforgiveness i just want to say to the church of jesus christ he hadn't licensed you to walk in unforgiveness I don't care what someone else did to you. I don't care what they said about you. The truth of the matter is it pales in comparison to what they said about Jesus. Are y'all listening to me? So would you do me a favor as we are trying to be what God is calling us to be? Would you go ahead and shout to every person that might not be here because the folk that are here know this. Go ahead and tell them that uh, God has not licensed you to walk in unforgiveness. That's right. He hasn't. And, and sometimes we harbor unforgiveness and we think it's our right. We think we've been licensed to do it. We think until they figure out what it is that they did to make me mad, I'm going to stay mad. And the truth of the matter is, you're just going to stay mad and get ugly in the process. It ain't worth that. It ain't worth, it is not worth what it does on the inside to walk around harboring unforgiveness. So the writer of Galatians says to us to try to make this point, brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin or any sort of any sort, you who are spiritual, you who understand what it means to have this new commandment of substitutionary love, please restore them in the spirit of meekness. Set them right. Get them back into fellowship. Don't leave them ostracized. Don't keep talking about them. Don't keep throwing them away. He says, restore them. Lest you find yourself upsetting some people also. Unless people find out you're not perfect either. Are y'all listening to me? So, 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 the first step in substitutionary love is you and I must learn to forgive. We read this scripture to you. I'll show it to you again because Christ is our greatest example. God made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. What does that tell me, Pastor White? That tells me that Jesus Christ took my place. He became what I was so that I could become what he is. Jesus Christ took my place. He became what I was so that I could become what he is. He became sin for me. That is my nature so that I could become what I was not, but he was, the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Only forgiveness can do that. Only the love of Christ can do that, can take you from what you were to what you should be. The second must. Y'all are with me? The second must is you must be willing to feel, to feel the loved one's pain. Everybody shout, you got to feel this. If we're going to be real about this, you have to be, you have to feel this. If we're going to be real about this, you know what? We said it on last week. One of the frustrating things to see, and we, we said it about in the story of the Good Samaritan. It is frustrating in church to see people going through, people in pews watching them go through. We say we love one another, we with you, but nobody, I mean nobody, sees it. It's sort of like what we see going on in our national debate about gun violence. And it's amazing how every time we have a mass shooting of any kind or anything, everybody floods the television airways to say your thoughts and prayers are with you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. It's like, man, when is somebody going to really feel the pain that, we feel, that we're feeling? Are y'all listening to me? It becomes frustrating when people give you lip service but give you no real service. Are y'all listening to me? So what substitutionary love does is it, it commands us to go deeper than lip service. You know, James, Jesus' brother, he says, man, 
I'm sorry, I think it's John. He says, man, what good is it if you tell your brother, I love you, and you see him starving to death? What good is if you go over, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, and you offer everything you have to the poor, but then you don't do it in love. You offer it to them and then go back talking about them. He says, man, unless you do what you do in the spirit of love, you hadn't really felt what they feel. It's not really real. Are y'all listening to me? And so what Jesus says, what the Bible says in Galatians 6, is it says, it says, bear ye one another's burdens. It says, I want you to not just give them lip service. I want you to help them carry what they're carrying. See, one of the things that is for sure is that if I'm carrying a burden that's too heavy for me, if Shippy comes and help me, because I'm, 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 I'm burdened down right now, if he would come and help me, because told, he told me he loved me. I don't know what's taking him so long, but if he would come and help me, thank you, Shep. Oh, God. And that's how we do. We just be sitting there saying, man, if you would just help me, I'll whiff you all the way. And thank you, Shippy. If he would just come and help me carry this, it is amazing what would happen. Now, come here. Now, as he helps me carry this, Deacon Lee, guess what happens? It's heavy for both of us. He feels the weight of it, too. You see that? You see that? And then Lee says, man, I love these brothers, too. Because Shippy about to break down helping me out. And then he helps me. And then guess what happens? It's heavy, but it's not as heavy because we're sharing the load. Until we learn to feel what others are feeling, until we make up our mind we're willing to be inconvenienced to feel what others are feeling, the love of God is not going to spread the way it's supposed to spread. People in our neighborhoods and our communities need to know that we care more than just getting them to our church. We care enough to come to their community. Yeah. I said, yeah. Now, I ain't get with one clap right there. Thank you for joining me as we go to the community. (laughs) They like, go to the community. Now, my Saturday is valuable. When we going? We'll let you know when we going. But but, but in order for in order for us to really feel what people are feeling, we have to go to where people are. I can't bear your burden, and you can't bear my burden if you never come to where I am. A new command I give you, that you love one another. On last week, um, we we told you at the first of this year that we were going to adopt two communities here in in our community and adopt two schools. Sister Michelle stood here and told you. On last week, we took the first step to adopting the two schools, Cannon Elementary and Houston Elementary. And at 6.30, uh, on, on Monday morning, last Monday, um, we had deacons and men up at Bojangles buying 80 biscuits for each school and, and, and juice or what have you so that we could deliver it to the teachers and the faculty there just so we could say to them, we see you showing up to teach our kids every day and somebody just wanted to let you know we appreciate you. I have received multiple emails this week from principals saying, thank y'all so much. One of my good buddies, who is the dean uh, dean up at um, Davidson College, has a a cousin who teaches at Houston, and he said, hey, man, um, you guys were at um, my cousin's school? I said, yeah, 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 I think so, Houston, yeah. He said, man, she could not stop going on about how overwhelmed the teachers were that you guys cared enough to drop them off breakfast. Something that simple. Something that simple. You say, you say, what is it about a biscuit? I don't know. It just, it just matters. It just matters. I mean, because I've had a Bojangles biscuit. It ain't, like, it ain't all that. I mean, it's all right. But I mean, come on. <laughs> I, we done all had a Bojangles biscuit. It ain't sent me into an email frenzy or nothing, but you know. It just, it just matters that people care and that people would say, I can be inconvenienced at 6 in the morning to show up where you are, even if you don't make it to where I am. Substitutionary love requires that we feel what people feel and that we get in their space to feel it. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. As Teddy Roosevelt once said, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Would you shout that down your road? People do not care how much you know until they care 
until they know I'm sorry, how much you care. The third must. The third must of substitutionary love is that we must be willing to fight for one another. Now, y'all heard that, and I, I must clarify, because some of y'all already heard it wrong. He just told me we got to fight one another. I did not tell you to fight one another. <laughs> uh, some of you got too much fighting. Yeah, I did not tell you to fight one another. Let's fight for one another. Everybody shout, yes, Lord. Say it again. Say it one more time. You know what, man, as we are, as, as we are living this thing, as we're walking this out, Man, I, I just, I can't tell you enough what it does to my heart to know I have people fighting for me. I have people fighting for me in prayer, fighting for me with, with, with kind words they may send in a text to email, people fighting for me. People showing up week in and week out to say, you're not by yourself. Man, it is an amazing feeling. But at the same time, I know I'm not the only one who needs to feel that. One of the things I love about Sister Mayola, who is already out to make sure she's, she, their, her team is serving us today, is that over and over she proves if someone is going through something that's sick or is, there's a death with a loved one in our family, I mean, this girl don't be on the phone. What are we going to do? How do we make sure? Do we need to send flowers? Do we need to feed them today? What do we need to do? And they're always just fighting to make sure people know that we really do care. Always fighting to make sure people know that we really do care. And it is amazing what can happen if that begins to spread throughout an entire ministry. The truth of the matter is she's inconvenienced like anybody else is. But, but real love, substitutionary love, it puts this command on us that we love deeper than our natural man would take us. Which means I'll fight for you even if I've been offended by you. Even if I've been hurt by you, I'll still fight for you. It's what I love about true love, what I love about the love of God is that it never grows old. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, prophecies will grow old. Speaking in tongues will grow old. But love never fails. It never fails. You show me somebody you're willing to fight for, and I'll show you a relationship that will eventually be reconciled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This lady right here and I, we will celebrate 22 years of, of, of I'm talking about marital bliss this week, but I can tell you, we didn't get here without fighting for one another. Are y'all listening to me? We could have given up on one another a long time ago, but love wouldn't let us. Are y'all listening to me? Are y'all listening to me? Would you do me a favor and just shout up towards heaven and tell God, thank you. Thank you for loving me and fighting for me, even when I was running from you, even when I was, when I was, even when I was bringing shame to your name, even when I was making a mockery of grace. Thank you for fighting for me. Yeah. Because that's what he did. He fought for me and you. And then he says, now I want to hand you the ministry of fighting for others. It's a huge challenge. It's not something that makes us shout because it's going to keep us up late. Not something that makes us, makes us, you know, say, oh, man, yeah, I get to go out and fight for others. But I'm going to tell you, when you think about this fact, that you wouldn't be here if heaven hadn't fought for you. It is so easy Listen to me, it is so easy to give up on folk, but it is so like God to refuse to give up on folk. <laughs> Would you do me a favor and just shout down your road? I don't want to do what's easy. I want to do what's like God. So easy to give up. So easy to say I've had enough. So easy to say I can't do this anymore with you. So like God to keep fighting. So like God to keep coming. So like God to become reckless and keep chasing. So like the heart of man to give up. A new command I give you. That you love one another. There are relationships that you have in your life that I have in my life. That the spirit of God is just shouting at each one of us today and saying, 
don't give up on them. Keep praying. Keep loving. Keep fighting. Because the best is yet to come. A new command I give you. That you love as I have loved you. And when God talks to me that way, Brother Walter, I'm just reminded that he fought for me for years. Years of rejection. Years of turning away. Years of being cold-hearted and hard-hearted. And he kept pursuing. And he kept fighting. And he kept chasing. And when you are a recipient of that kind of love, it melts your heart. It overwhelms you. I, I don't know how you can be a recipient of that kind of love and not reciprocate it. And not say, you know what? I know this don't make sense, but I want to keep fighting for this. And then they offend you and they leave you and you say, well, hold up, hold up. I know this don't make sense, but I want us to get better. And you keep coming and keep coming. And they keep acting up. And I'm telling you, how many of you have ever had to love someone who had some form of an addiction? Those are some of the toughest situations, man. And I'm telling you, when you have somebody who has an addiction in your life or in your family, man, it's like the whole family. Everybody has the addiction. What should help us to love deeper, to love substitutionary, is the fact that we all in here are at something. <laughs> like, you guys are looking at me like, I ain't done nothing. And I'm just telling you, close your eyes for a minute. Heaven wants to show you something. That cross was necessary for you and for me. And he loved us through it. And he loved us anyhow. And he challenges us to do the same. Y'all listening to me? Lastly, the last must of substitutionary love is that you must have faith in the loved one. Everybody shout, please, whatever you do, keep believing in me. Keep believing in me. You know what, Dr. White, I thank God for you every day because I know you believe in me. The truth of the matter is, if those, those of us who have lived this life for any length of time, we can, if we are honest, say that there have been times in our journey where we lost faith in ourselves, where we did not believe in us. We did not believe that we could take this next step. We did not believe we could accomplish this next venture. And yet God put people in our lives to have faith in us when our faith was failing. Now, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's fine. Maybe you've always known you were the stuff. But what I have found out in life is the most confident of people can have their confidence shot if folks start believing in them. See, the curtain's going to go down on all of our acts one day. It's just a matter of when. There'll be a new preacher in here one day. There'll be somebody else up singing one day. Somebody else will be on the drums one day. But right now, we still say, man, y'all doing a good job. That helps them to keep on practicing, keep on playing. What if we came here and said, I ain't, he ain't feeling that drum, Mello. <laughs> That's right. Man, when folks stop believing in you, it can mess with you. I love sports. I love sports, so I hear it all the time. People say, I was just watching last week, and, uh, and um, uh, Bubba Watson won a golf tournament. He's a real emotional guy, and Bubba Watson won a golf tournament last week. It was his first time winning in just over two years. And, they, and Bubba, I mean, this was a regular tournament. It wasn't like the, a major tournament in golf. And when he sunk the last putt, he started crying on his caddy's arms. I'm talking about profusely. He's just crying. He even like he had just made this huge accomplishment. I mean, he won the tournament, but it wasn't a big tournament. All of the biggest names in golf weren't in the tournament. And they asked Bubba, they said, Bubba, as always, your emotions are pouring out of you. They said, why, why are you so emotional? And Bubba said, man, um... 
just over a year ago, I was going to give up, God. He said, I lost my confidence. I didn't think I could win again. I didn't think I could do it anymore. He said, man, and my wife believed in me. And he said, my caddy wouldn't let me quit. And immediately I thought, man, that man is broken by love. Nothing like winning. I'm telling you, it's one thing to go out and try to win when everybody's against you. But ain't nothing like winning when those around you really believe in you. It'll keep you motivated. It'll keep you running. So I want you to do me a favor real quick before we come up here. I want you to reach over and just touch somebody real quick and tell them I still believe in you. Yeah, I want you to love them real good. Tell them I still believe in you. I do. I know this isn't an easy journey that we're on, and I know this isn't something that that can be taken lightly, but as I praise teammates ready to come, I just want you to know that you're not by yourself in this endeavor called life. I think that is this, this, uh, this, this amazing tension that comes, the tension between those who don't believe in you and those who do. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living my life concerned about who don't care. I'm grateful for those who do. I'm so grateful for those who do. I know this, that if you and I come to love one another enough to keep believing in one another, and we take that outside of these walls, the world is going to encounter a people who have not shown up in their neighborhoods and communities to judge them, but rather, rather to say to them that we have shown up here to say to you that somebody still believes in you. And as you're standing here today, as you're sitting here, you may be here, you say, may say, I have, I have found myself at a place where I was ready to give up. I found myself at a place where I didn't have or felt like I didn't have anything to give. You may feel like you have nothing left to give now. But I want to tell you that the devil is a lie. Your gifts, your purpose in the earth is too great for you to live a meaningless life. Every hour.